All right, everybody. Hello. Welcome to the Maid Forum. I'm Katie, project manager here at the Maid. Uh, so Maid Forum is a space that is dedicated to developers, gamers, creatives, uh, digital artists, teachers, anyone across the uh, digital entertainment space uh, to just come in and share your knowledge with us. So come by, share your knowledge with us. We're open to new speakers all the time. Uh, this month we're focusing on workers' rights in games. We have two sessions, one today, and one is February 24th. Um, with our guests who are uh, from Weimar, Roger, and Rosenfeld, a legal firm that's dedicated to workers. And we'll do a Q&A after the talk, so have your questions ready. So show of hands, um, how many of you have heard some stories in the news about the gaming industry, like layoffs, sexual harassment, Bad things happening. Yeah, yeah, we've heard about this. Sounds familiar. Um, how many of you have been impacted by a layoff in your career? Get yeah, right on. <laughs> Same here. Um, raise your hand if you know a lot about workers' rights. I feel like you know a lot. I know some of you know this a little bit. Okay, awesome. awesome. Uh, workers' rights is becoming a really popular topic right now. According to GDC 2024, the State of the Gaming Industry Report, which surveyed 3,000 workers this year, 56% of game developers are worried about major layoffs. Younger developers are 157% more likely to support unionization. So today, we hear from Matthew Earle, who has worked with employees who started the union at Sega, and Michaela Posner, who represented a former Activision Blizzard employee who sued her former employer. So to get us started, uh, do you want to tell us about your firm? Whoever wants to go first. Sure. So, as you said, Katie, uh, Weinberg, Roger, and Rosenfeld is a firm that specializes in representing unions. Um, our headquarters, or our main office, is just uh, a little up the street in Emeryville. Um, we also have offices in Los Angeles and Sacramento. Uh, we represent clients mostly in California, but also outside of the city. Um, we do some we do some individual employment work, like the Activision case I worked on. But for the most part, we represent unions. Um, we help unions organize workers, and then once the workers are organized, we provide the support needed to help them get a union contract. And then we help them enforce that union contract, and also enforce any other applicable state, federal, or even local laws. Awesome. Um, so, a personal question for both of you: What made you go into uh, labor law? Wants to start. Sure. So uh, my background prior to going to law school was in the migrant workers' rights space. So um, I had um, yeah done nonprofit work focused on enforcing and expanding the rights of migrant workers. You know whether it be farm workers or also the issues related to um, temporary work visas in the United States and all the you know, issues that touch that. And then. Um, through that work, I from law school, yeah, did, did as much work for stuff as I could, and I really enjoy working with unions because it's a, a mission-driven organization that's run by its own members, and that answers to nobody but its own members, and uh, you know, it's a movement that seeks to change things rather than simply treat the symptoms of our corporate system. And I guess I'm a little bit of a nepo baby. My dad was a union lawyer, although he does not work at Weinberg, Rock, and Rosenfeld. He had his own firm, uh, so he was a competitor. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to work with you. Um, so let me know. Uh, so growing up, my dad would take me to work with him. I would go to court with him, arbitrations, hearings, and I would see firsthand the impact that his work had on individuals. Um, and the people he worked with were so grateful for the assistance, and it made just this monumental impact in their lives. You know, and I, I remember, you know, I was still in like middle school um, when the 2008 recession hit, and I remember hearing on the news about all the jobs, the thousands of jobs that our economy lost. And then my dad would come home and say, "Hey, I got someone new job," and I thought that was just the coolest thing ever. That you know, you could have that one person could have such a, a positive impact on another person's life. Um, and so I wanted to help people similarly. Um, and so I, I learned from him, I guess I studied the craft, and then uh, by the time I went to college, I knew I wanted to be a union lawyer. 
So I studied industrial labor relations in college, went straight to law school, um, started working for the firm when I was in law school, and then came on full time after, after passing the bar. Thanks for sharing. Okay, um, let's see. Matthew, can you tell us a bit about your experience working with uh, the employees who wanted to be in SAS? Yeah, and actually, I think we may have, or I think it's important that we, we also just kind of explain what's a you. Right. Oh, yeah. um, what's collective bargaining? So, uh, so a union is an organization of workers that is designed you know, for uh, mutual self-protection and to yeah to basically instead of being you know a single individual worker going to the boss to negotiate wages, work conditions, dignity at work, whatever it be, a collective of all the employees who together are stronger than an individual can be, and uh, most workers in the United States have the right to form a union at their workplace. Um, California public sector employees and government employees have a right to organize a union, and then across the country, private sector employees have a right to form a union um, most of the time, unless you're a supervisor of other employees, or unless, you know, very specific carve-outs, but for the most part, employees can join together and form a union, and then their employer must bargain with them to get a union contract that then defines what their rights are, their wages, their working conditions, their protections from being fired, their whatever it is that the union and the employer can agree on in the union contract, that's then enforceable, and um, yeah, has real teeth, real protection. So, so. The one thing I want to add is that it not, a union is not just an organization, it is a democratic organization, right? And it, it works, it, it only runs, it only operates by involvement of the members and by members engaging in the democratic process to elect their leaders, to elect their bargaining team members, to complete surveys and vote on what the priorities are going to be in bargaining. And this is a fact about unions that employers always downplay, that it, it is a democratic organization. So then turning to the, the SEGA campaign, so um, we work with a lot with the Communication Workers of America, which is, so unions often have like a, a top level organization called the International Union. So the Communication Workers of America is an international union. They have local unions that focus on different geography or different themes, and CWA has been one of the leading unions as far as organizing in technology more broadly, and especially in video gaming. So the CWA um, organized the SEGA workers, and um, yeah, so they, you know, they went and talked to workers, and the workers talked to each other, and um, you know, there was a lot of support for the formation of a union for SEGA USA. It, it is limited to the employees in the United States, right? Most SEGA workers are in other countries, but yeah, and they did a really great job of organizing, and uh, then, you know, they do all the hard work of organizing, and then they come to us and they say, okay, now we want to make it official, um, what do we do? So, usually, you know, the, the usual way to get a union formed in the United States is to go to the federal government, to the agency called the National Labor Relations Board, and say, hey, we have a lot of support for a union here, we want an election. So um, that's what we did, right? We went to the government and we um, asked for an election. And then we, yeah, on the legal side, there were a lot of issues that we had to resolve before an election could go forward. Like which workers belong together in one, it's called bargaining unit. So, you know, resolving issues of who belongs together in one unit, who is more of a management person and who's more of a worker, right? You don't want the CEO in the union, that wouldn't make any sense. Um, so there's kind of just sort of preliminary issues to work out, but you know we worked those out. We some of them settling, some of them litigating, and we got our election. And um, the Sega workers were hugely successful. They got more than 70 percent of the vote, which is an exceptional performance for that large of an election of hundreds of workers. Um, so that was a big success. And yeah, and then they, you know, they've been bargaining for a contract. Um, unfortunately, there were also a lot of layoffs at 
Sega late last year, and the union has, um, has told the government, filed a complaint saying that those layoffs were illegal and violated the National Labor Relations Act. So, yeah, I mean, uh, so that's ongoing, uh, you know, trying to reach a contract and trying to uh, resolve these layoffs. And, yeah, so that's kind of the sense. So before they uh, approach you, they typically need to, employees need to gain uh, support for the union first, is that right? Yeah, well, I think it's important to remember that. The, um, so we are partners with unions, but really it's unions, it's, it's all about, yeah, the unions do most of the work. We just do the legal, we're just kind of the higher hand that deal with the legal system for people. So this union, I mean, they're very sophisticated, they're very skilled at what they do. They had already um, organized all these folks, and then they just came to us and said, can you help us, you know, get the election? So um, the union, you know, I don't know whether in this particular campaign, I, I can't speak for this particular campaign, but sometimes there's something called a hot shop where the employees are like, hey, union, you know, we, we really want, we really need a union around here, can you come and help us out? That could be one way that campaigns get started. Another way is that um, the union identifies, hey, this employer, you know, this might be a place where we could successfully unionize people who are interested in the union and they reach out. And it starts with just conversation between coworkers. It's the most important thing. You take somebody out to coffee, one on one, ideally in person. But these days, you know, maybe Zoom instead of a phone call. Or anyone. Just face to face contact, getting to know people, and it's get hearing from them their concerns, why it is that they believe that, yeah, or what it is that the issues that they're having at work, so that once you identify those issues, you can help resolve them. So it kind of starts with that, and then. You ask people if they're on board. Yeah. Awesome. So, how might um, employees encourage their coworkers to form a union? This is a question for you. Well, I think, like Matt said, it really starts off with organization, uh, with communication. Uh, excuse me. Communication is key to everything that we do. Is key to what unions do. Um, and it often starts with communication about, you know, what sucks at work. You know, like. A lot of the time, a union campaign is a response to a bad boss. So what is it about the workplace that is frustrating? Is it the low pay? Is it the long hours of work? Is it a hostile work environment because a particular manager or supervisor is a jerk? Is it a hostile work environment because of a protected class? Like race, or gender, or sexual orientation, right? Um, you know, or maybe is there a problem with scheduling? You know, a lot of employers used to use like that just-in-time scheduling where you would have to text in a couple hours to find out whether or not you were working, right? Um, yeah, I see eye rolls. It's a horrible system. That is a really good reason to unionize and get a contract so that way an employer can't do that anymore, right? Because um, it's not illegal, but you can bargain so that an employer can't do that anymore. And so having those conversations about what are the frustrations in the workplace, what do you want to fix? about the workplace, or what are your anxieties around work where you can provide that extra security? So having those conversations, figuring out what those priorities are, uh, that is a really key first step because once, because people are afraid to talk at work, right? The boss is there, you don't want to be overheard. But you, but people who are employees and the private sector, you actually have a right under federal law to talk with each other in the workplace about work. If an employer says you're not allowed to discuss your salary with others, that is blatantly unlawful because they're doing that to try and hide pay disparity. Okay, so having those communications, breaking down those barriers, opening up the floodgates, and finding that you're not alone is a really is a really critical first step to organizing the workplace. Awesome, and how do employers uh, try to dissuade unions from serving? Uh, I can... <laughs> Let us count the ways. <laughs> yeah. So, fear, uncertainty, doubt, those are, you know, classic tools. So, I think usually the strategy is to make people fear for their job, whether that be through, you know, assertions that it's going to hurt our business and we won't be able to, you 
know, you don't succeed as a business and therefore a lot to lay you off. It could be that, or it could just be explicit threats that I'll fire you if you organize. Um, Actually firing somebody who is known to be a supporter of the union. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really common, it's really common, yeah, it's really common for employers to simply target the person who they think is a troublemaker and fire them to make an example of them so that other people are afraid and won't come forward. But it, there's also things like forcing you into a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a, a manager about the union. It's a very uncomfortable situation, right? It really strikes fear into people because we're just empowered the moments there. Um, I'll also just say, there are a lot of things that employers cannot do during, yeah, well, yeah, there's a lot of things that employers cannot do during a union campaign or even at all to try to dissuade people from unionizing, but there are a lot of things, there are so many things that they can do that are legal that are almost doesn't even matter. You can lie just blatantly to people, to your employees, um, as long, yeah, as long as it doesn't, as long as it isn't a threat or intimidation within the definition of the National Labor Relations Act. So there's a lot of, you do a lot of lying, a lot of misrepresentation, and it's completely legal. Um, so, yeah, I would say it just is fear that arises out of the power imbalance at work between management and line workers. Um, so, yeah, but like, you know, the, when people get fired for organizing, that's illegal. And we can go to the federal government and fire a complaint, a file a complaint, sorry. And, um, you know, I had a case where that, you know, happened last year where a worker was really, really brave. He was having his coworkers sign union cards just right out in front of the front door of this warehouse, in front of the security camera. He didn't care. He told the manager, this is my right. I'm exercising my rights, right? This is incredible bravery. And he, of course, gets fired for a, you know, security violation, right? And we have to have a trial because the company just won't admit that they fired him because of the union. And then we finally got a federal court order that said, you must place this person back at work. So they had no choice. They tried to buy him out for a ton of money. He was like, I'm not interested. I'm going back. So under penalty of, yeah, the federal courts, this guy got to go right back into work and go back to work. And that's the kind of really powerful victories that we can get with the legal system, They're really difficult to get, but um, yeah, it, this stuff is illegal, and uh, yeah, sometimes our laws really are. Oh. <laughs> Captive audience meetings are also very common, uh, where an employer will, will force employees to attend a meeting under threat of discipline if they don't attend or if they leave. They'll bring in uh, an anti-union consultant, or as we call them, a union buster. Um, to essentially come in and spread lies about the union. Um, the most common trope that we hear is that the union is going to take your money because, yes, people pay union dues. Um, but when you look at the, the raises that unions want for their members compared to the dues, it still results in a net raise. Um, and so that's a common trope. You hear, like, oh, you really want the union like, bargaining for you, like, you lose your individual voice, which isn't true because it's a democratic organization. You actually have more to say with the union there. But uh, like Matt was saying earlier, the power of difference, when you are represented by a union and you are collectively bargaining, you are sitting across the table from management as equals. And that scares management, right? Because they don't want to give up their power. Um, you also see management saying, oh, well, tell me what's wrong in the workplace. What do you want me to fix? Right? And then knowing that there's a union election coming, they'll make positive changes in the workplace. So like those raises they've been promising for three years will suddenly materialize, right? Um, in certain instances, if the union, if the request for an election is already been filed, they can't do that. Um, you know, and stuff like that. So it's, they, there are very few lanes they will not go to. Yeah, and, and they're willing to spend millions of dollars to keep a union out of just one work site. Like, and these, these union busters, I mean, they, they'll pay them like $450 an hour. Um, oftentimes they are former um, union representatives who were criminally convicted of stealing money from the union. Like, and so they're basically disgraced union members. That, that's their favorite, you know, job to do after they get disgraced out of uh, 
Yeah, the labor movement. So yeah, these are not, these are really sketchy people who get paid a ton of money to lie. Um, in a campaign that I did, the, the company spent a million dollars, over a million dollars, just on YouTube us not excluding their, their legal fees. So yeah, a lot of fear. That is shocking and disturbing. Thanks for helping us see the bigger picture here. Uh, so we'll switching gears a little bit, um, Kayla, can you tell us about your series? Um, working with an ex-employee from actually Blizzard to sue her former company. Okay, how many of you saw the news lately about the settlement that the state reached, the CRD, with Activision, like in the last month? Okay, how many of you know about the settlement that the EEOC reached with Activision in fall of 2022? Okay, so uh, this is normally the e so the EEOC is the federal agency that enforces Title Seven. The CRD, the California the Civil Rights Department, it used to be called the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. That's the state agency that enforces the State Fair Employment and Housing Act. The two laws um, overlap significantly, but the state law is more protective of workers, allows for greater damages to be recovered in the lawsuit. And normally the EEOC and CRD are siblings that get along, right? They work together, they're like, well, we're not gonna duplicate each other's works, you're gonna go after A, we're gonna go after B, or we're gonna go after the same entity, we cover these claims, we cover these claims. And they share the work because agencies are underfunded, overworked, heavily burdened, nobody wants duplication. For whatever reason, that didn't happen in Activision. Um, and the EEOC reached a settlement agreement with Activision, and when I say Activision in this context, it is Activision Publishing, Activision Blizzard, Blizzard Inc., and King.com. So those were the four defendants that were known as the Activision entities. And so the EEOC reached this settlement agreement with Activision, and this was a nationwide settlement, so it covered people in over seven states. Um, including California, but in order to receive money under that settlement, you had to waive your right to recover money under state law. You had to waive all other claims that you had that were related to sexual harassment, uh, pregnancy, discrimination, and So you can cover, you can claim money under the federal statute or the state statute, and that's not normal, right? Normally, the federal government cannot do anything related to state claims, and the state government can't do anything related to federal claims. It's just, it's not their jurisdiction. They're not allowed to touch it. That line was crossed here, and that upset the state, and it upset uh, the worker that I worked with, a former Blizzard employee. Um, she called for uh, DEI initiatives in the workplace. She's like, this is not a great workplace for women and people of color. We need DEI initiatives. After that, she was harassed, she was retaliated against, she was targeted, um, and the workplace became so hostile that she was forced to quit. We call that constructive discharge, right? Where you quit, but it's because it's, your workplace has become so awful that no reasonable person would sit there. So she was constructively discharged. She would have been covered under the federal settlement, but she didn't like that she had to waive her state law rights in order to recover. So we tried to intervene to force the court to get it to change. Because in these types of settlement agreements, it has to be approved by a court. So the EEOC settlement has to be approved by a federal court. The CRD settlement has to be approved by a state court. So both the CRD and this individual I represented, we tried to intervene to force the court to change it. The court was like, no, we don't see a problem with this. We're like, what? That's ridiculous. How can you not see a problem with this? This is absurd. Like, under the under Title VII, the most damages are determined based on the size of the employer, and the maximum any individual can recover under Title VII for the biggest employer, like Activision, of that size, is three hundred thousand dollars. That is the cap. The state law has no cap. And so when you hear about multi-million dollar settlements and verdicts because of sexual harassment cases for one individual, let alone a class of thousands of workers, that is why. Because state law does not have to count. So asking California workers to waive their state law rights was massive. And so we took it to the Ninth Circuit, which is the Court of Appeals. We argued it in front of the Court of Appeals. Um, there were other problems with the settlement too, like $18 billion was a pretty low number. 
considering what happened, how bad things were, and the number of people affected. Um, and it took a while for the court to decide. In the meantime, that's when the CRT announced their settlement with Activision for 54 million. Right? Much bigger settlement that's just for Californians, not people in other states as well, right? And so after that, the Ninth Circuit was like, oh, you guys got what you wanted, everything's covered, we're just gonna rule against you here, and you know, everything's gonna be perfect, right? And so, you know, we lost the appeal and we're disappointed about that. But at the end of the day, the state managed to get Activision to pay people who also participated in the federal suit, in the federal suit. The state said, no, we're not gonna let you off the that easily. You have to give these people money. They'll get an offset, which is what would happen in court anyways if there was no waiver, right? So like if under state law you get $6,000, but you already got 1000 from the federal settlement, you only get five because your total is still gonna be six, right? So that's what's allowed, and that's what we wanted from day one. So even though we lost the case, you know, you lose the battle, but we won the war. Um, and so that's uh, that's the activation case. <laughs> wow, that's pretty amazing. Um, so can unions help prevent harassment in the gaming studio? Yes. How? So you already have protections at the federal and state level through legislation that prohibits discrimination, retaliation, and harassment based on protected categories. The state law has more categories than federal. In addition, all of the contracts that we work with have anti-discrimination and anti-retaliation provisions. So that is a third layer of protection. In addition, under California law, if a worker is being harassed by a supervisor, the union can seek a restraining order in court on behalf of that worker. The worker also has the ability to do that individually, but it's easier if you have somebody fighting with you that has done it before and can afford to hire a lawyer um, to help out with the process. Also, on a realistic note, and this is what I tell union clients all the time, if you know about member-on-member -member harassment, right, so it's co-worker harassment, not for a manager or supervisor, I encourage the union to get involved and to tell the member that's harassing, hey, you knock it off right now. Don't wait for the HR investigation. Don't wait for that other worker to be so frustrated that they're forced to report it. Knock it off right now, right? And that is a lower level resolution. It is often a quicker resolution and it is lower stress for everybody involved. And so the union is uniquely situated to protect the interests of everybody involved by getting harassment to stop as soon as they're aware of it. And I'd also just add that as far as just discrimination or quality and equity generally, you know, most workers under a union contract, they know exactly why they're getting paid, what they're getting paid, and they know exactly what everybody else is getting paid, usually based on how long they've worked there. And so this kind of transparency means that if there are disparities, at least they're more out in the open, or they're less likely to happen in the first place, because there's logic as to what why people are getting paid, what they're getting paid, and there, there's transparency. Also, most union contracts have what's called just cause employment, which means that an employee can only be terminated if there's a good reason to terminate them. So if an employee is engaging in sexual harassment, then the employer can still fire them and you know, they get their job back. If, you know, but, but oftentimes we see, we defend a lot of employees who've been fired under collective bargaining agreements, and oftentimes, um, there wasn't a good reason to fire a person. And we all know that that is more likely to affect people of color and women and you know minorities of various kinds. So yeah, if, if the employer has to explain why did you fire this person, or did you have a good reason, and hopefully prevents these sort of disparate treatment firings in the first place, and if they do happen, the union can defend the person in a legally enforceable proceeding where if they win, the employer has no choice but to take them. It also forces the employer to conduct a thorough and proper investigation. Um, and unions under the law have a right to request information by the employer. Um, and so if the worker complains about harassment and, and it doesn't seem like management is doing anything about it, the union can come in and submit a request for information and 
demand that the employer tell them, like, are they investigating? Have they conducted any interviews? You know, of course, there's still some confidentiality that's maintained during the course of these investigations. Um, but the union right to request information is an incredible tool that unions have in order to protect and represent their workers, you know, in the grievance process, which is how you enforce a contract, and also in the bargaining process when you're figuring out what that contract is. Awesome. So can unions help uh, protect employees from like this? Yeah, so it's a good question. I think, so again, let's think about just the bigger picture, right? When you have a union, it's not just you going to the boss and trying to go to you. It's you and a collective of other people who can help support you. So unions, you know, most in most unionized environments, you know, layoffs, if the employer wants to lay people off, I mean, at the end of the day, they're going to be able to lay people off, but the union, there's going to be more of a conversation about how are these layoffs happening? Are we laying off the most, the least senior person first? You know, that's typical under union contracts. Um, right, so that way we can't have discrimination in terms of who's laid off. It's just purely how long you've been here, you know, been here long, sorry, you have the least, you know, stake in this company, so you're going to have to be the first to go. Um, we can negotiate severance agreements that are fair. We can, um, whatever it is that the collective thinks is the fairest way to deal with layoffs, um, that's great. And you know, there can be a conversation about should we be laying people off. Of course, there can be. Um, but I think you know, it's like, yeah, it, I'm not gonna say should we layoffs. It's just it's more of a conversation and there's more of a fair business. And in the event that the employer needs to rehire in the future or you know the union can make sure that their members are prioritized and that of the people who are laid off that the most senior among those gets brought back first um, and just to make sure that you know what's the order of layoff right like really making sure that a layoff is a last resort option to save the plant from shutting down and everybody because at the end of the day you know that's something that employers say oh the union's going to force us force us to shut down no because then the, every all the union members lose their jobs and the union doesn't want yeah, just as a, a concrete example, like during COVID, a lot of hotels shut down, right? And we kind of all understood we didn't need the housekeeper doing housekeeping in the hotel room because we were really staying in it at the very beginning of the pandemic. But the hospitality union, the United Here, which is a really awesome union, they really made sure that after these huge layoffs the last few months, that people, those folks, got their good union job back. Um, so they did, yeah, they made sure that have their livelihood again and also help them, you know, while they were out of work, help them with their unemployment application. So, yeah. Um, I believe that Telltale Games back in 2018, um, a large amount of employees were laid off with a few days' notice, and maybe this is something that can be bargained for. Of course, yeah. There's also state and federal laws in place where, depending on the size of the layoff, um, or if the whole location is closing down, you're supposed to get at least 60 days of notice. Um, the idea is that you should be given enough time to line up another job to minimize the amount of time that you go without a paycheck. Um, because yes, the state has unemployment, but the state's preference is that you find another job as soon as possible so that you don't have to pull from unemployment um, or draw from unemployment. So, um, you know, if an, if an entire facility shuts down under state law, they're supposed to get notice, 60 days notice. Like what happened with uh, at Twitter, it will always be Twitter. I, I don't care what, you know, who says. But, you know, with all of those sudden layoffs where people found out they were laid off when they couldn't log into work, that's unlawful. Right? And yes, the union can help with that too by saying, hey, under the contract, you owe us X number of days of notice, and you owe everybody X number of days of pay for each day of notice they should have had, but didn't. Um, you know, but the you know the state and federal laws cover larger layoffs, and so unions can come in and make sure that those smaller layoffs also get the same notice. All right. So, what are your favorite positive facts about unions, or if employees want to uh, unionize, um, what facts can they arm themselves with? Um, so, I can't really remember the numbers, it's been a while, but in law school I did a bunch of research about 
yeah, just the effects of unions on like equity and equality in the workplace and the levels of gender pay disparity, racial pay disparity, disparities of all kinds are much lower in unionized workplaces. Um, and yeah, so I would say that's like a pretty compelling reason to do it. To build on that, that the nationwide pay gap um, in, in the United States is E. So for every one dollar that a white man makes, on average, the will make eight cents. And we know it gets worse when you count race in that analysis as well. In a unionized setting, it's 96. So that's, in, in California, it's 89. So even in California, where it's better, having a union still makes a difference. Um, my favorite fact, it's more of a macroeconomic fact, but when you think of like times where the middle class was booming, right, like that post-war era right after World War II, that's because union membership was growing. And so when you look at the history of the United States, look at our economic history, and you look at income, and income inequality, the higher union membership is, the lower income inequality is. Um, and so right now, which I believe is the second field of the income inequality is staggering, right? Like just look around the Bay Area, right? With greater union membership, overall income inequality is. Awesome. All right, let's open up to audience questions. Does anyone have any questions? I actually have one from online. You'll have to repeat it because we can't hear anything with the stuff in that. Uh, but uh, Jed online says, I'm very curious to hear what is and what isn't legal for a company in terms of union busting and anti-union training pamphlets. That's a really good question. So what is what is and isn't legal when it comes to union busting and anti-union training? Uh, yeah, pamphlets. Pamphlets and other... Yeah. Well, so, yeah, employers are not allowed to make threats. They can't say, if you, if you unionize, the plant will shut down. Or if you unionize, you'll lose your pension. Right? They're not allowed to make threats like that. Um, and those will often be statements that are made during a captive audience meeting, will be sent by managers and supervisors on the board who are working uh, with workers who are considering organizing. Um, yeah, it's going to be, right? That's kind of it, yeah. Because uh, they are allowed to lie. Unions can't. Unions can't say, oh, we'll guarantee you a 5% raise, right? Like, no. The union can only say, we promise we will bargain and ask for a 5% raise. But the union can't guarantee an outcome. Whereas management can say, you know, anything that's, anything on that point. And just to give an example, you know, threat doesn't have to be like a gun to your head, right? So let's say you work at a video game company, and, or you work at a company that's contracted with another video game company, and they're doing, you know, some part of the production process for them, right? And so your employer tells you, oh, I don't know, Blizzard hates unions, something like that, and, and we might lose our contract if you guys go to union. That would be, that's the kind of, that's a very common kind of threat. It's like the people that we do business with don't like unions. So, you know, it might not go so well. And it's out of our control, but, right, so that's an illegal threat. Um, in my case, yeah, that's an illegal threat. Even though it's not, you know, all fire you. Even though it's like a claim that, oh, it's out of my control. Um, that kind of thing, right? You also can't say, like, you're not going to get anything better than so you have now if you form a union, right? Because that's saying I'm not going to market good faith in the union and reach a deal. I'm just you know, telling you that you never agree on that. So. Or even if you organize and you form a union, it's not going to make a difference. Nothing's going to change, right? We call this statements of utility. Um, those are and CWA on their website has a really great guide to all the lies that you can expect employers to say or need. Do you guys have any thoughts on the recent LRB ruling on Semex? Does it help now with making the idea a little easier? Sorry, don't have a lot of space. Sorry. I'm going to let you take this one. No, so why? Go ahead. Do you have any questions? I asked the recent LRB ruling on Semex help out with the future of the future. Great question because Matt worked on that case. Woo, 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 woo. Still working on it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, our firm represented the Teamsters in that case. They'll be working on the Teamsters 
in my case. Um, yeah, so for those who don't know what this decision said, it said that if a majority of employees sign an authorization card saying that they would like the union to represent them, you know, the typical process now is you take those cards, you go to the government, and you say, I'd like an election to decide whether the union will represent me or not. But very often, there's this, all this kind of illegal union busting that happens during the process. And then, you know, the union might go from 55% support, which you only need 50% to get the union. It might go from 55 to 49 because they threatened all these people's jobs, yada, yada, yada. And common sense tells us, come on, a majority of people wanted the union before. Why do they not want it now? Well, probably because of all the illegal stuff that had happened. But um, previously, the remedy for that was usually just to have another election later, right? It was like a gimme, a, a, a mulligan, whatever you want to call it. Um, and now the law is, well, after, you know, after there's a majority and the union tells the employer, hey, we represent a majority of your employees, come bargain with us. After they say that, um, there usually, in most cases, there will still be an election, but if the employer commits any unfair labor practices that are at, at all substantial, um, then rather than going through the farce of rewriting the election again, they just say the union won and um, yeah, and so it is. It, it has the potential to be a really big deal. I think it's um, when it came out, it was, it was really like kind of a shockwave in our niche um, because it was the biggest change in the law on union organizing in at least at least since the Supreme Court that case that came out in 1968, if not before that. So um, it has the potential to be a big deal. I think. All of us need to be aware that the, our entire government, our entire administrative state is under attack by a Supreme Court that's appointed. You know, we, we all know what's going on, right? I mean, so in this Semex case, the um, employer is arguing that the National Labor Relations Board has no authority to hold it accountable for anything. So basically that it shouldn't exist in its current form, that it's unconstitutional. So if that's what we're dealing with, well, you know, yeah, I think this is great, but I think we also have to realize that our democracy is under attack. And so, yeah, these kinds of rules are great, and I think this kind of ruling is a really good barometer of whether there's any hope left at all. But um, anyway, it's at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the highest federal appeals court, and that court will decide whether this doctrine, this Semex rule, will stand or not. Um, or they may or may not decide. They're either going to decide or they're going to pass on the question. But it's very likely to end up in the Supreme Court, either in this in this case or another case. Um, so yeah, we'll see. But I think it has the potential to speed up the process of unionization by encouraging employers to simply voluntarily recognize a union rather than requiring an election among a group of people who they know a majority already support the union, right? Or by, you know, hopefully employers will start to think, oh, there's actually consequences to committing unfair labor practices. Um, and so if I commit this unfair labor practice, I'm stuck with the union, so I'm going to behave. I'm not even going to risk um, running, you know, an anti-union campaign because there's such a high risk that somebody will say something illegal and then I'll be stuck with the union, right? That kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. It's a big deal. We're really excited about the potential of still figuring out the real world implication. But I think if, if somebody's organizing right now, they yeah, they should get that majority support among their coworkers, and they should go to the boss and say, we have a majority, you should recognize us, it's the law now. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm actually glad to hear about this ruling because it answered part of my question. Uh, my partner and I have both dealt with, uh, from discrimination to seeing a uh, university commit like illegal actions against an attempted union. 
Yeah. You all kind of covered this already, but I'm wondering, because we both felt very lost when this happened and completely changed careers as a result. But like, what sort of actions can one, like a union take if, if the employer institution is committing like blatantly illegal actions against them? And in our case, like because the union was prevented, they did literally the thing that suddenly like, suddenly only 45% of us want to vote for the blocks and stuff like that. Um, what sort of actions can individuals take? Like in our case, the union lost even we ended up kind of got the individuals. Um, when like, a employer or institution takes like blatantly illegal action. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase the question. What kind of action can an employee take when a um,
or there's going to be, so the, the, the federal government will investigate and then either a new election will be held or there'll simply be an order saying the union is certified. That's been extremely rare until this new rule, but it has, there is a path, there's always been some path around. But um, I would say, yeah, I think, so yeah, I mean, I think when, when things, Federal law is violated. We believe we should be filing unfair labor practices. Um, and you know, most campaigns that I work on that we lose, there's some legal violation that took place. So that's very common. Um, and, and it is kind of a cool thing that the federal government will, you know, once you file that complaint, it's a one-page form. All you do is file that. They will investigate. They'll, you know, call you in. They'll interview you. Um, and then they'll ask the employer, hey, what's your side of the story? And then, you know, they will take them to trial um, if they need to, if they can't settle it. Um, so that is something that is available to work on know about. So if they violate the rights that Michaela was talking about by, yeah, if they threaten you, if, if they say things that, yeah, if they threaten you, if they in some way discriminate against you, whether it be changing your shift or whether it be firing you, right? It doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be firing. It can be a lot of things. All those things can be investigated and remedied by the federal government. I mean, even if you're wearing a union yes button or sticker and you're told to take it off, that's a violation. Thank you. Um, my question for Matt, can you talk a little bit about the conditions at Sega and how they like what they were like before and after unionization? Um. If you not the really. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was uh, what the conditions were like at Sega before and after unionization. Um, well, so I can't specifically speak about it really. I can tell you that, so the video game industry, I'm no expert, there's probably a lot of more experts here, but it's an industry where um, traditionally people have been underpaid and overworked because they're passionate about what they're doing and they really want to work in the industry for that reason. We see it in other industries as well. And so they don't get their fair share like they might in some sort of, you know, I don't know, fintech or something that doesn't have the same appeal, um, right? So I think that has led people being underpaid and overworked and underappreciated and, um, you know, and so that certainly, I think, it's no different at Sega than anywhere else. Um, and as soon as the union wins the election, the union is the representative of the employees, and the employer can't make changes to wages or working conditions without first speaking to the union. So they can't um, suddenly say, oh, you can't work remotely anymore, you have to work in the office. Nope, you've got to go talk to the union first. Um, you, you know, we're, we're not, yeah, whatever, whatever difference is, you know, we're changing the break time to 1 p.m. for noon, and you can't do that without talking to the union first. So that's what happens the, the minute that the union is certified, usually after an election. Um, but you also have to bargain a collective bargaining agreement uh, so that you can get the full Full benefits of having a union, and um, that's still something that's in the works. It's a really difficult process, um, but once you get that first contract, then you really get the full benefits of
because a lot of people don't really know that these laws do already exist that are designed specifically to protect people who have these membership, um, how do we inform the public or someone can convince them to vote against measures that are in that they're designed for their best interest in mind? That's a great question. To paraphrase, how can we become more aware about uh, protecting workers' rights um, in the video game industry? Yeah. I think, you know, to the extent that there are industry-specific problems, right? I mean, we already have very simple wage and hour laws. They're not simple, they're complicated. It's called job security laws. But there are already wage and hour laws on the book. However, if people have a salary, they are often exempt um, from wage and hour laws, including overtime. Um, and so I think there's always a possibility, and we've seen this happen in California, where there is, a, there is room for industry-specific legislation. Right? Like, if you ask me, the long hours that uh, quality control people have to work in order to make sure a game works, I think that's a health and safety issue. Because you have fatigue, you have eye strains, you have headaches, you have like literal physical ergonomic concerns, right? So I think there's room for legislation on hours of work and health and safety matters uh, that are unique to the video game industry that aren't really shared by other industries, right? Like there's there's nothing that prevents law from being very industry specific, right? Of course that has to go through the legislative process, but that's always an option. In terms of like highlighting problems within the industry and how it affects workers or is infringing on workers' rights or even just harmful to workers, um, I'm a huge proponent of naming and shaming and making it go um, because otherwise, how are you going to get the public behind your back if they don't know that there's a problem? Um, and while you are informing them of the problem, you need to explain why it's a problem. And then you kind of put employers on the defensive where they suddenly have to explain why 18 hours of quality control work in front of a computer is not harmful, right? You know, just kind of make those common sense arguments. I mean, social media has been incredibly powerful. Um, in spreading awareness about workers' rights. Um, and unions and the workers' rights more generally are currently, you know, very trendy, right? They're experiencing a positive moment um, on social media and public perception. And so just kind of relaying on that, or I guess building on that to say, hey, this is what these problems look like to this industry um, can go a long way in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I would just say, like, if, you know, if you're interested in unionizing or curious, you know, you should definitely reach out to a union. I think if you're in the video game industry, the one that comes to mind is CWA. They have a really great website, lots of information. Um, or just, you know, go, like, I think we should all work on educating ourselves about what our rights are. There's lots of great information online. And just... We need to understand that we have those rights and that we should talk to our coworkers about whatever issues are happening. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in organizing, reach out to a union and they'll, you know, if, if it's a good fit, they'll they'll assist you with the process. It's something that's you know best done as much help as you can. Awesome, thank you so much for the awesome answer. I think we are at time. I want to thank you both for having us. This has been so educational and informative. Keep fighting the good fight. Thanks for what you do. Thanks for having me.